Hey everyone, I'm so excited to share this episode of the Building Thinkers podcast with you. I talked with Shawnee Person, and we had a wonderful conversation focused on one of my 12 favorite problems. How might be where your feet are become my primary way of being? Shawnee is the co-founder of Wonder, an insight and experience design lab, which aims to inspire and support companies, institutions, groups, or individuals to help themselves and others thrive through more human experiences. We went deep in this episode, talking about the importance of creating contexts that take into account the fullness of our humanity in our learning experiences, the facade of control in our lives, and the awareness of our mortality, and the connections that awareness can bring to the art of being present and letting go of urgency. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Shawnee Person. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast today. I'm so delighted to be joined by... Shani. Shani, I'm so excited to meet you and to dive into one of my 12 favorite topics. So in this season, we're exploring these 12 favorite problems. And today we're going to be talking about how might be where your feet are become my primary way of being. Okay. And it's worded intentionally because this idea of become my primary way of being acknowledges that this may not be a place we can always be exactly that. So with that, thank you so much for coming on and I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited too. All right, let's start with a little bit of your story. If you can give our audience a little bit of background about what it is that you build, what is it that you do, and maybe a little bit of how you got to the work that you're doing now. Amazing. Yeah, so I run a company called Wonder, and really what we want to do is make work more human or humanize the way that we build workplaces. And I think I, actually the story or my story, my experience leads into to why that is. I spent better part of a decade working in various HR functions, doing a lot of different things, everything from culture to learning, leadership, most of the functions that span across, probably with the exception of recruitment maybe, but a lot of holistic work also with employee experience and really diving into that. And I think I kept running into this notion that we're not really creating contexts that are taking into account the fact that we are human beings and we have brains and we have bodies and we have souls and we have lives and we have all kinds of things going on. And a lot of how we create context for people in the workplace isn't at all respectful of that. To the contrary, sometimes quite destructive towards that. And I spent a long time kind of being the entrepreneur anarchist person who kept asking hard questions and twisting things around. And at some point I got to the sentiment that I want to have more span to just explore these questions. And also I did a really big flip at some point and I just started leading through questions just in that exploration of I don't believe we have necessarily the answers to this. I believe we need to have more conversations about these things. I want to build spaces, places, workplaces, but any space really where we feel like we can show up in our full humanness, whatever that means. And what that really is, that's uh, that's part of the work, I think. Oh, that's incredible. And so as you think about that journey and the transition and building wonder, what are some of the things that you've seen that people have started to come to you for when you're exploring these questions? What are the things that they're wrestling with that maybe draw them to you? Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's, I have in each world, so I work with both what we need to do. So how can we work in a more human centric way? How can we use insight more? How can we actually approach employees and collaborate and co-create with employees in the workplace? And that's one, one piece of the puzzle. And the other piece is really a central question that has come up for me as I've been creating this on my own is also who do we need to be as mm individuals as humans as organizations to actually be able to create something different Mm. and so i also use a lot of bandwidth and space to just trigger self-inquiry i would say or self-curiosity 
because if there's one thing that's come across in all the conversations I have, and especially also diving into the other side of, okay, what is it that we need then? Is mm -hmm. self-awareness is such an important part in this. And but yeah, that's also become a really central piece that I converse with a lot of people. Who do we need to be? How do we need to think about things? What do we need to know about ourselves? And how can we use that to generate something better, more meaningful for us and for other people? Mm. That's making me think about this. So in self inquiry, I spend a lot of time in this space as well. And I I'm always thinking about how do we support people in that self inquiry? One of the things that I've done recently that's a part of this podcast season is create these thinkativities. And I think self inquiry is really the best way to describe like what they are. I love taking research and best practice and some of these things around self assessment and the things that we want to maybe shift. But then how do we get from that research or that insight into putting it into action? And I think that idea of self inquiry again is helping me have a label maybe for what that is. And I tend towards that area too, because I think I've, I have found it to be helpful myself. And when I look at my own learning and career journey and life journey, it, it really was the ongoing recognition of what I like to call learning agility and this neurological flexibility to not just learn, but figure out what should I learn next? And what do I need to actually unlearn? What mindsets are no longer serving me and going forward from that place? I don't know if you've seen, if, if any of that resonates or you've seen that to be true. Yeah, definitely in terms of learning and using that self-reflection that you point out that kind of, it is hard to go from that space of curiosity to actually take action. We might understand a lot of things and still like yeah. the gap between this and the other, but I really s sincerely believe, and I worked it for a long time in learning, and that was one of my biggest twists to it. When people would ask me about a learning culture, I would say, I think we should stop talking about learning cultures. I think we should start talking about reflective cultures because you can do no learning without reflection. Ooh. There is no learning without extracting something and reflecting on how this applies to me or why is this relevant or how will this work? So yeah, definitely I also see that relationship as painful as it is because self-inquiry is not always easy, but it's definitely necessary. Yes. And as we think about the kind of central question of how might we be where our feet are, what brought you to maybe interest in this particular question or how do you see this as central to the work that you're doing? Mm, that's a really great question. Again, I'm, it's never one thing with me, so I'm going to try yes, and yes. answer in a, no, we have in a multifaceted way. Yeah, amazing. So I think it's two, well, at least like two dominant parts, but definitely a, a more. One is one part that I see and that I see when you work with human centered methodologies or with iterative work mm -hmm. is that you have to accept where you are in the process. Mm. And I think we tend overall in like other ways of working that we have previously or ways of working that are more process driven. We tend to start by chipping away at these big things or like huge visions. And actually that just makes everything impossible. And you just have to look around and go, okay, what can I do right here? That takes me towards this, but that isn't necessarily that yet. I know a few years back, I threw in this analogy with the team that I was leading, where we kept talking about what's going to happen in six months, what's going to happen in a year. And I was like, guys, I have no idea what's going to happen in six months. That's a really long time. And at some point I remember I said, this is like driving with a GPS in your car, right? So you like, you put your destination in, you have a sense of where that is, but you can only look at the square. And you can only use what's in the square to move forward. And when you do, the next thing is going to appear to you, but you can't zoom out. There's no zooming out in this map. There's only using what's around. And so one thing is that for me is in the work is both like actually trying to enjoy it. Cause sometimes when you build stuff, you're so like stuck in, oh my, when it's going to be this, but it isn't. And now it's this, and that's pretty awesome too. Like now it's this little seed and we have all this stuff that we can do with it. And so it's both in terms of the enjoyment, but also in terms of actually leveraging 
Mm. what it is we're seeing, hearing, sensing, understanding in the moment, mm. instead of trying to build this huge thing that is a hypothetical. We don't even know if that's going to be it. Yeah, that's a big piece. Mm. Then I also think working that way or even mm. on a personal level, how I then want to live is to also show up with presence. Is mm. it's very easy to always be like either stuck in the past, ruminating on things, thinking about this or that drama that happened or didn't happen, or always be pushing yourself into the future and totally forgetting about just what does it take for me to show up with presence right now to life, to any interaction, to this interaction. Actually, that's been like a word even that I've been consciously leading with this year so far is just thinking even how I'm planning my days. I'm like, okay, what does it need to look like for me to have energy to really be present in the things that I commit to? Mm. Because, yeah, it's weird. Like you, It's like this meta thing. If you're not there, then you're not really experiencing it. And that's also a bit sad. So, yeah, I think it's at least those two are the two big things that I both on my level. I just want to show up for life. But then also in the work, it's, mm. I think we miss out on a lot of opportunity because we're always trying to be somewhere else. Mm. I think that's so powerful. It's making me think about the process of active listening when in your mind, you're thinking about the next thing you're going to say, instead of actively listening and being there present in the moment, it's almost like that on the big scale of life of I'm thinking about the next thing. I had a podcast guest come on and talk about happy when I dis. I'll be happy when that next thing. I'll be happy when, and partially we can be kind to ourselves here because like we're wired that way. We're wired for growth. We're wired to not be fully content where we are as a part of our growth mechanism. And there can be so much good in that drives us to, I think this comes probably from an evolutionary perspective to keep hunting and gathering and find the next thing. And that just looks different now. However, I think it gets very easily out of balance. And this can also depend on your lived experience and maybe your Enneagram number or something like that, but where you can be so driven by what is not right here and what could be that to your point, you miss this enjoyment. The other part of like, when can I be right here? And you were talking about looking at your calendar or your daily events and things like that. I've also been thinking about this of, in the past, one of the areas of growth was just putting margin on my calendar. There's a lot of deep work to doing learning experience design and working with clients and different things come up and all of that, not to mention the rest of life and other roles. And so I thought I was doing good by putting this margin in place. And that was a step. But what I've recognized more recently is thinking about the ability to be present, not only in the time, but also, and I think you mentioned this, the energy and the ability to show up, not just from a time perspective, but from a fullness. And I, I actually talked to another podcast guest about this, about availability, that the availability mm. is not only time, but that presence and energy. I know, I think I made a, a post pretty recently on, on LinkedIn, and I talked about the kind of difference between availability and approachability. Ooh. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot also to your point of being energetically available as well when we show up. I think I personally have really mixed those two up a lot. Mm. And so I've made it a thing to always be like approachable and available. Yes. And all the channels are open all the time and you're always answering stuff. And I have two kids that are fairly small still and still need a, a parent that is there and present. And only quite recently did I speak to someone and she said, oh, I find you really approachable. And I thought, oh, that's it. That's the difference. <laughs> there it is. Yes. I can be approachable, but I get to still manage my availability. Mm -hmm. I can be energetically open to be connecting to people, but I get to choose the moments when I answer. I get to choose the moments when I book meetings. I get to choose a lot of different things around it. And that can look different across different moments in life, moments in the year, depending on what's going on. 
And then on the other hand, as you're saying, it's also so easy to think we're like putting all this margin in around ourselves and then we're still being approached all the time and poked at. <laughs> this is something I have to really practice with myself because I know a few years back I was listening to an episode of one of the IDEO podcasts. Somebody spoke there about having a maker schedule or a manager schedule. <sighs> And I thought that was such a good distinction because they were like, well, if you're a manager, you probably have a lot of small meetings, short ones, not that much space in between. But if you have a maker schedule, if you want to create something, you need to have big chunks of time that nobody can interrupt because creation isn't like an on off switch. You have to yes. actually give yourself the space to lean into it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of play, I think, with mm -hmm time and what do I need to be energetically approachable and still like when I do come in actually be energetically there mm. I've found myself sometimes so approachable <laughs> that whatever wherever I show up I'm like okay and then I'm always like on to the next thing and something is ringing somewhere and you're like checking all your channels and it doesn't feel good this sounds familiar. <laughs> it's like I'm sure it's been, familiar to it's a like lot of It's like you've been in my phone or on my <laughs> screen. And one of the things in the spirit of self-inquiry that you brought up, can we explore what do you think might be behind that sense of that this is even a thing that we have to figure out? And what I mean by that is not, of course, time and space is challenging in modern communication, but more, why is it hard for us, maybe some more than others, to just say no or block the calendar in that way and then not accept the request that's in the block or not respond to every LinkedIn DM, you know, but why is that hard? That's a great question. I don't have all the answer to this either, but let's see where we can reach together. I think two things come up. One is it's hard to reject people. Even when you're doing it for all the right reasons, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think it feels that nice to tell no, no. somebody no. no. It's, oh, and you don't want them to take it badly. I also feel like there is something about the sense of a missed opportunity. Mm. And yeah, if I say no to this, am I going to miss mm. out? It's not yeah. necessarily the, like it is FOMO, but not necessarily. A lot of us want to help. We mm. want to be nice. And it feels not nice again to say no, yeah. but ironically i sometimes think is yeah but why like mm. why are you saying yes because if you say yes for the wrong reasons that's also not very nice yeah. and yeah i think we do a lot of that too i was reading essentialism recently ah, and it was I that's that definitely book. like a definitely is something that points you to thinking about how you bring more value but not necessarily like more value in more places just more right. of you to the places that you choose, which I think is a good, it's a good inquiry to have with ourselves. Yes. And I think to your point earlier, it changes in different seasons. It might be that there's more availability in certain times or seasons. And maybe part of this functionally is the way we approach our own kind of rules and norms. And maybe we can say yes to a lot of things, but in the proper boundaries or the proper times or via email instead of different ways. I've also not solved this. It's why I asked this question. And I think for me, one of the threads that's connected is some recovering perfectionism and people pleasing of like middle school Tracy being a little bit nerdy and not necessarily included in the cool kids group and not wanting anyone else to feel that way. And also maybe the understanding of the neuroscience of belonging and rejection and psychological safety. And so it just feels, oh, the answer should always be yes. And having also read Essentialism, I love that book. I reference it frequently and actually have embedded the idea of priority as singular versus priorities as plural into my learning agility cohort content. And that book and those principles did help me to recognize where it can be kind and compelling for your organization or for your clients or for yourself to have some of those boundaries and understanding for the whole group to really flourish. And yeah, that's something that I took away there. I have a sentence stem that I like that is, if only people knew, can we play with that? If only people knew when it comes to 
being where your feet are, is there a thread there that you think might be helpful? Mm. If only people knew that doing the thing that feels the hardest is probably actually the best for you. I think that's the first, like the scenario that came into my head. I know I've, for the longest time I used this excuse, it's going to be more stressful for me to say no than to just push through and do it now, for example. And once I started challenging it, I'm like, oh, wow. There is another experience on the other side of this that actually wasn't as bad as I thought. So there's something about that, like, if only you knew what's on the other side of your excuses, you probably would use less of them. Ooh, I like that. I might have to think about that for a second. We're trying to be where we're, our feet are and something is coming in that disrupts that, but we go that direction because it seems like the alternative is harder. But then we have experiences in which we do the hard thing and we get to the other side of that. And that experience actually allows maybe more freedom is what's just coming to me or more clarity or more alignment to the work we're trying to do, the people that we're trying to be. Maybe there's something to that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I want to add just listening to you also that I think sometimes we always associate the hard thing with a thing that is the most work. But sometimes the thing that is the hard thing is the thing that awakens the most resistance in us. And it might be the opposite. Mm. So as I'm hearing you say that perfectionist, I was that girl too. I was that girl who didn't have a lot of friends. I was that girl to put all my energy into the schoolwork. And there was always, there was always a reason to say yes to doing work. But also for me in this being where your feet are is actually recognizing what's coming up for you right now, mm. because I can only speak for myself, but I can tell you how many times I should have stopped three hours before I stopped. <laughs> and then I come into the next day and I have nothing. I don't mm. have energetic presence. I don't have enough to actually give into that day anymore because I didn't listen to what was present and what was coming up in that moment. Even last night I had trouble sleeping and I was like really early in the morning and I was contemplating, maybe I should just get up and... <laughs> journal and exercise or do something and then i heard myself say yeah maybe i should do that but my body is really tired and i was like oh i already know the answer <laughs> like i'm gonna sleep <laughs> but how often do we not listen to it mm -hmm. like we know we're too tired but actually it feels scarier to like maybe at that point just go no i'm, I'm gonna put this work away and tomorrow it's still gonna be here tomorrow it's still gonna be fine tomorrow mm. and so when we think about this pushing through, we often also associate it. Yeah, I'll do the hard thing. I'll put the work in. I'll just like power through. And, and sometimes I think actually maybe is the hard thing something else. The hard thing is having the self-inquiry to actually stop and go, huh, what's going on with me in this moment? And if I were to just listen to myself, what would I choose right now? Hmm. And daring to do that, because that's the work in my world. Ooh. Yes. That's really powerful. I think it's in particular resonating with me the three hours beyond where we maybe should have stopped. I may or may not have done that a few times. Then I already can see if I pull that thread of what is then to pause and say, okay, why am I overworking here? Or why am I feeling like this thing that was maybe urgent for someone else, but is maybe not urgent for me. I'm taking on someone else's urgency, which can happen, or I'm over identifying, which also can happen to me with my work, which is tricky mm -hmm. because I've spoken about this before, but I really love my work. It's very fulfilling for me. I'm doing things that I'm also often in the social impact space. So I am helping, I am working on human potential with companies and individuals and like, all oh, that's great. And it has its proper place. And I can, when I am operating in this be where my feet are for work and the things beyond work, then I find I can be more present with my boys and play on the floor with them and get really into their worlds when I am where my feet are at work and where my feet are there. But it is a ongoing practice of meditation of sorts to play the mental 
intention out in, for me, I think mind, body, and soul, like all come into alignment to say, this is what I want. I might be feeling this way. I need to think about something else that's like an SOW or something that I have to figure out that's changed, but that is still gonna be okay. That is gonna be figured out and I can be here and later I can be there with maybe like a cup of tea to come back to the computer. I think what arises in me when I'm listening to you is also that being where your feet are, it requires an amount of faith, actually. We always talk a lot about trust in work and like trust in relationships, but leaving things hmm. is also having faith in in the process, in the fact that when I leave this, it's going to be okay. Not, it's not going to fall apart when I'm not here. Yeah. And usually we come back to it the next day. It's yeah. not like we abandon things yeah. forever. So it's also that there's so much pressure. You're also mentioning children. I also find there's such a dissonance there. We also put so much pressure in each and somehow it's like really hard to avoid all the distraction of all the commitments like when you're working yes. you might be thinking about the kids but when yes. you're with the kids you're like i'm just gonna check my phone and, uh especially in the way the world looks today mm -hmm. and the tools that we have available as you're saying like it is a mental practice you have to yeah. have so much discipline mm -hmm. but i like the word practice because mm -hmm. i think it also is accepting that it's not perfecting anything, it's practicing yes. every day. So there's a little bit of space to not be perfect. <laughs> yes, it's like running experiments of sorts. Some of my practice mm. experiments have been, okay, I won't have my phone between the hours of 5 and 8 p.m., which is prime family time. So I've had seasons where this has not been perfect, where I've put it in my bedside table drawer and closed it and said, okay, this is going to be this time. We know there's all sorts of true addictive practice connected to our need for dopamine hits in all of our notifications. And I think one of the ways that has been best explained to me is the idea of having a slot machine in your pocket of I could pull down my email thread and an opportunity could arise that could be like life changing financially for my family. Of course, we're like stuck and connected to that. It's not just likes on Instagram, although that's lovely, but it's that too of like really big things could come through this mechanism or like scary things or notifications of you forgot to pay your taxes properly or something. I don't know. And so it is this, yeah, act. And I've tried these practices. And when you were talking about faith, it made me think about this. I think part of this is the facade of control that we think we have as humans over our work. And like anything, I think two things can be true at the same time. You can be a really wonderful co-founder and mom and employee, all of these things. And there's an extent to which there are things beyond our control. So even if we work the extra three hours, it could still fall apart. When I think a lot of our world on this came a little crumbling down, a lot cr crumbling down over the last several years when people thought jobs were secure and they changed and their finances were secure and they changed or their health was secure and it changed. And I think it did awaken a lot of people to what do they really want for their lives? The thing that they thought was secure and their protection became insecure. And I think there, there's a lot of grief to hold there and collective trauma from the experiences we've had. And I now see also lots of opportunity, not to be the like glass half full person, but I do see that it has awakened people to say, I want more of this be where my feet are because maybe I was home and I experienced being with my spouse in a different way because we were both home or more time with my pets and my plants became exciting to me. I don't know. That one didn't really work for me because I kill all my plants, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe I other struggle people. with that too. <laughs> like, that did not work. I have maybe fake somebody plants. else is more luck. In that case, please give us <laughs> tips. I will also take them. I was like, you that know? one instantly didn't feel authentic because I was like, mm, plants, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. I can relate 100%. I think a, a year or so back, I interviewed a friend of my family. She works in palliative care. Mm. We talked about death and kind of what is it that people actually want. Mm. And then she also shared later on this project that she's working on, on something that she calls existential well-being. Mm. 
And it's basically this idea that the way we're living now, and I think in particular, like living in a Nordic country, which is very secular, we don't build resilience and we don't have enough awareness and conversation around the fact that our life is temporary. <laughs> and that in itself, she said, you, you see it in palliative care. Mm -hmm. The person who is going to die usually does the best because they like, okay, mm -hmm. they know what's coming, but the people around them, mm -hmm. she said, they, they are so shook by what am I supposed to prioritize now? And she said, it's also very clear that we often live as if we're going to live forever mm -hmm. <laughs> and we don't actually like actively make that a part. Not, we don't have to think about death all the time, but actually remember there's a limit to how much time we have. Mm -hmm. And I, I carry that with me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually have more of that intention. How do I actually want to spend this time? You have no idea how long that is. Mm. Is this it? For me, that's actually as morbid as it might sound. It's also really part of that conversation that I have with myself is, mm -hmm. and as you're saying, a lot of us probably were awakened to that through a lot of the collective context. For me, especially control has always been this thing where I'm, I think it's an illusion. I don't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I never tried to hold on to that, but I think it's really interesting this, just this thought of, because when you put it in that perspective, how much easier do the priorities actually become? And, and it also then moves back to me to your point around urgency mm -hmm. and all this urgency that we create. And then we get stuck in these loops of urgency. And I still, even just a few months back, I was walking from the supermarket to home and I was all distressed. And all of a sudden I heard in my head, what's the rush? And I thought, yeah. I actually have no idea why I'm running. Like I created this urgency. I could walk backwards home. It doesn't matter. And so much of this manufactured urgency that's just taking us away from thinking, what is actually important with this time that I have? What do I want to do with it? Yeah, I actually do think we need to think a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think that putting it into perspective, what we want our lives to be about and then thinking about what that means for each day for each moment it's making me think about early on you said what kind of people do we need to be in order for these shifts and things like that and now i'm thinking about that okay who do we need to be to live in this way where we're aligned to what we want to spend our time doing and i think it does go to what do you think the purpose of life is what do you think the purpose of your work is what do you think like your roles are about and it is very easy i think that there's i'm going to sound like a little hippie here but that's okay i think that there's a piece of in particular in america <laughs> like consumerism and capitalism that drives this ongoing need for more and do more so you can buy more so that you can and it's like to what end who decided that those are your values and what you need and want did you really decide that are you influenced by everything around you and i think we we want to think we're immune to that and no this is my style or these are my things do we really need more of, of so many of the things that we spend our time then working for it's i think the term is the hedonistic treadmill of just go do and i think also a hamster wheel and a lot of my friends are in the same kind of season with young children and so it does feel like this hamster wheel of both parents are working and all of the things it can just feel exhausting and so not to mention other periods of life where you might be a caregiver for parents or things like that but i think this pause to say our time here is limited then does allow us to be more clear about what is then essential if we have limited time, resources. So I don't have an answer for that necessarily, but I think it's worth consistently reflecting on and having conversations that don't need to only be reserved to the end of life. No. And also actually, as you were talking, and I really agree, we get caught up in these either periods of just like very intense life logistics, but also to put this, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also this wheel of like constantly running after 
doing to consume. And it also just made me think how your question is be where your feet are. And I think the being is also the operative word here that we also put so much value in our doing that we forget, like we get to show up and exist in spaces. Mm. And I know I've particularly thought about this so many times when you talk about performance reviews or any other tool and people like, yeah, and we're gonna evaluate. And I'm like, how are you going to evaluate? Sometimes it's really like a person just brings their energy. Mm. They might ask a question, what are you going to evaluate that? <laughs> like, how, how? What are you going to say that they're doing? Sometimes it's our being that is, and often that's what we're after when we're talking about being where our feet are. It's also like actually being Ugh. ourselves and relying a little bit more on that sentiment and then being open to whatever we're feeling in that moment. But I think I also just, your comment on consumerism also triggered that thought for me that we're really over-reliant on this need to do something all the time. And that also becomes scary to then be present where you are or just be because then I'm not doing something and oh my God, what am I as a person? Am I even worth anything if I'm not doing something? Oh. Which is a really sad thing, I think. I know this is gonna also, as you're saying, this might sound really hippie, but in the city where I live, which is a coastal city in, in the south of Sweden, we have this bath house. So it's very Scandinavian. It's like this, you walk onto this ponton, it's out in the ocean and you go swimming naked in the ocean and you sit in the sauna and you look out at the ocean. And so I go there sometimes and it's perfect. You lock your phone in a cupboard and you don't look at it for two hours. And I remember sitting there once and I was just watching this bird like diving into the ocean, catching a fish or something. And I thought, I'm sure this bird isn't asking itself, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> it just does. This is the thing that's inevitable for it to do. It needs some food, it's gonna go get it. That's it. It's just mm. existing within itself. And I thought, oh, how nice. Like, <laughs> how can I be more like that? Okay, what? what's present for me? How do I want to bring my energy into this? And then, yeah, it will translate into doing as well. But I still remember I was looking at that bird and I thought, huh, I'm pretty sure I'm making this way harder than it needs to be, actually. Oh, my goodness, Shani, that's really, that is very much resonating with me. And I think that nature sometimes offers us that glimpse of peace and puts us in our proper place. Sometimes when I just go for a walk, of course, there's science behind all of this, but just from my experience, like when I go for a walk and look at a flower and look at a leaf and there's the whole process of forest bathing, of being in that nature and the restoration that it allows for. But I just see that one of the pieces of that for me is I am so insignificant in the broader scheme of all this in a not like negative way. It's just like, this thing, whatever I'm worried about is going to be okay. And it's not going to move like this piece of grass is not going to move and change because of this thing over here. And it's beautiful in that way to not take ourselves so seriously sometimes and to kind of release. And there's a piece of surrender in my own spiritual practices and process that I think is connected to this. And the other part that I was thinking about as you were speaking to this is the being, the being instead of doing. And that's been some definite rewiring for me because I have been so prone to, and again, culturally and everything around, you're rewarded for the doing. I'm constantly rewarded by my clients. Like it started with like elementary school and my parents will tell me this story about how I put myself to bed in kindergarten because I wanted to be ready to like learn and then along the way I had like a 4.0 in my master's program and it was just constant affirmation that that is defined as success until I decided to redefine for myself what what I really think that looks like so this being I'm seeking more of that hence the question and have seen when I can be more focused on the be instead of the do I think that there's more joy and presence to see the bigger picture in that being. And I think we're wired for that. And that's a piece of what people feel like they're maybe missing and feel over scheduled and over hurried. And like they're chasing something they can't quite get to. 
And I keep wondering if we just stop <laughs> and pause and I don't have a place quite like what you described to go like swim into the ocean, but like maybe for me, it's walking here or things like that. We have beautiful blue bonnets right now here near Austin and there's a trail by my kid's school that we can see those and just be reminded every time I'm driving them to school, I'm like, I love where we live. It's beautiful. I'm so grateful to be here. And my boys are like, why do you say that all the time? I'm like, because when I look at it, I'm like reminded of that, of the, it's reflected back to me and I want to be grateful. And it makes me think too about the science that you cannot be both anxious and grateful at the same time. You cannot hold those two feelings at the exact same time. And so this idea of our practice there, I think could be maybe interconnected. I love so much about what you said. First of all, nature, I also think it's a huge, it's a huge part of my days. I'm like, quite often I look at trees. I'm like, oh, I, I can always figure some lesson out from looking at a tree, whatever is happening in my day. Oh, look at this old tree. <laughs> look what this I tree did. It. It's stood here for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. But then also listening to you, I'm thinking, also this switch into being, which yeah, I resonate with that a lot. It's a big part of my spiritual practices as well to not put as much value in the doing or as little as possible actually. But equally then sometimes it's actually led me to also, and that, this might be an unpopular like view, but also move a little bit away from this pressure of the purpose, the bigger calling or the bigger mm. purpose and sometimes focus more on meaning mm. because meaning is much more, at least in my mm -hmm. interpretation of these words mm -hmm. is much more accessible. You can mm. find meaning in making a cake for somebody and, mm. or you can find meaning in having a conversation. Does it have to be attached to your bigger purpose? No, not necessarily, but oh. it can still feel yeah. really meaningful. And so sometimes I'm also like, yeah, take the pressure off. Like, if I'm meant to be me and my work with me is about being more of myself, it's not being better, it's being more. If I'm assuming that my being is enough, whatever I am <laughs> underneath of all the layers of programming, it's already great. Yes. I don't need to be better. I need to be more of me mm. as much as I can. And then it's more just leading from that. Oh, mm. this feels meaningful to me or this feels good. and. Yeah, because we were touching on that, like clarity, control, like those are very elusive feelings. And yes. So yeah, sometimes I also try to get a little bit more granular. And yes, purpose can be a really good conversation to have and great, but also really hard. Mm. And sometimes you can't figure it out. And what then everything's going to feel like meaningless in life? Of course not. That'd be terrible. <laughs> like then I think, yeah, then the being and just the search for meaning in how I, whatever the interaction is something that really helps me. No, but okay. Is this my life's purpose? I don't know, but does it feel meaningful? Yeah, it feels nice. I'm thinking about purpose and meaningfulness. And it, to me, what strikes is like that it lets us off the hook and in connection to our question, allows more of being because you're not trying to analyze or identify the making of the cake, for example, to should I be a chef now? Like it, there's like a pressure and it's interesting because I'm in this space, right? Of potential development and I love it and I'm pretty obsessed with it and I love productivity and I love like growing potential into reality. So the words are really important and this meaningful making meaning and finding meaning can be anywhere and can be any moment with any set of resources or lack of resources so it strikes me as just really accessible that we can find a way to to be making the cake and to have our mind do the practice of thinking about the meaning there Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I could talk forever. Yeah, <laughs> I also, but I also think actually it brings me back to one of the things we talked about in the beginning, which is also being what opportunities are accessible now. Hmm. And sometimes in the moment you might have a really good sense of your purpose, but what we, what you can choose now in being or what brings you joy or what like leads you and gives you a sense of meaning or happiness or whatever it is that lights you up. Those are different sentiments for different people. That's all you can choose from mm -hmm. anyways. Yeah. 
And I just, I listened to somebody the other week, they were talking about this. It was a study on how people make decisions. Mm. And they said, people are more satisfied when they make completely random decisions. Huh. Actually, when they don't think it through too much, like all the studies show that the more you think it through, the more likely you are to either regret or change your decision later on versus when you actually are just leading from your intuition or like randomly choosing, then you're usually more satisfied. That's really interesting. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Cause I'm, and I'm saying this as a person who spent like a decade working with strategy and yeah. I'm good at strategy yeah. right? and I can enjoy it too. And I understand the use of it. And I sometimes think as humans for ourselves in our own life, when we over strategize in the moment, yes. oh God, should I choose this or that? Then yeah, you're not, A, you're not present. Like B, you're just trying too hard. <laughs> like, this is so, also yeah. very challenging for me because I am a strategic consultant and learning experience designer. And sometimes I try to strategic consultantize my family or our <laughs> like food management process or my friends. And so I now say for my friends, who might be going through something, would you like friend Tracy, strategic consultant Tracy, or some <laughs> combination of these in this instance, because I don't want to try to solve if I'm not supposed to. No, but I get it. I think it's hard too. And I also think it is there are lots of these like dichotomies that kind of mm -hmm. live together. Of course, it's inevitable to think about the future. We want to build it we have dreams we're excited about things and we can still be in the present and we can still enjoy the present even if we're not there as you're saying instead of i'll be happy when like i'll be happy now and i'll be happy then yes. and i'll still move towards creating that and i'll have that in my mind's eye leading the way thinking about that give that gives me a sense of direction mm. but yeah i think it's if it's one thing actually that i've seen through also these like more human centered processes mm -hmm. is also that sometimes you like shouldn't jump the gun on the solution part. Right. Just yeah, hang out with the problem for a while <laughs> and then have a little bit of faith that you're going to mm -hmm. figure it out. I just was talking to an amazing woman called Maya Watson last week and she was talking about a project and she said, I feel like it's changing direction and it's unveiling itself to me. Like I'm not changing it. I'm just unveiling <laughs> through my choice and through being present and yes. looking at what is. I'm just like, oh, this is the thing that was here all along. Mm -hmm. So there are all these, I think, like little mind shifts that are like linguistically yes. sound like little nuances. And they're not taking away from having big dreams or big ambitions or a sense of purpose if that is something that you feel strongly about and that you really have. But it still just calls you to being curious in the now and being in the present. So I'm, yeah, I'm always on a lookout for those formulations. Like, how do I choose this word instead? Does it help me to actually inquire about something different? Yes, I love the power of language and taxonomy to make us think in different ways. And it brings, I think, clarity when we're working with others too to have some of those same insights for themselves and back to that self inquiry. Okay, Shawnee, I could clearly talk to you for days, which is wonderful for us, but I've found our listeners tap out at about an hour. Let's <laughs> transition to any book recommendations that come to mind based on our conversation, any podcasts, and then I wanna make sure that people know where to find you and wonder and anything about that. Yeah, great. I think Essentialism that we touched on is, is a book that's really been great and to counter that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to challenge somebody who's listening. Don't read a single book. <laughs> Listen to your own thoughts. Ooh. Sit still with your own feelings because we're so reliant on everyone else's instructions and competence and ideas and best practices and whatnot. And in the end, we never copy anything straight from somebody else. And in the end, we need to trust ourselves a little bit more. And so actually, yeah, I think that would actually be my big thing. I, I love that. Inquire with that. Inquire with yourself. Listen to yourself. Maybe even, I do this from time to time, mm -hmm. I cap it. I don't yep. listen to anything. I don't read anything. I watch K-drama and that's mm -hmm. it. And I don't, I like, I purposely listen to myself. 
Mm. Because in in the name of this consumerism we also just put a lot of value on whatever stamp certificate whatnot you have but so you like we all count oh. our thoughts our experiences everything so yeah i would say that i needed to hear that thank you <laughs> I'm, I'm happy i'm happy it came to you in a good moment yes. and yeah and if you want to reach me linkedin is definitely the best way that's also where you can find Wonder, so you can follow along in House of Wonder, which is an incubator community that we have, a digital collective that we recently took out of beta testing. So we're trying to eat our own medicine, try small and build from there, basically. Yeah, and I've always, I'm definitely approachable and I'll answer when I'm accessible. <laughs> oh my goodness. Shani, thank you so much. My goodness, this podcast has been such a delight because the people that I get to meet have just shifted my thinking and it's really amazing to be able to come on. Sometimes I've met people before, sometimes I haven't, and to just be able to go so deep quickly. And so thank you so much for your presence, for being where your feet were today. And I'm going to be thinking a lot about this conversation, I think, after this. And I'm excited for our listeners to just also marinate and think about the takeaways and i'm looking forward to hearing from our listeners about different ways in which they are putting this into practice so thank you so much i'm excited to stay connected thanks so much for listening to the building thinkers podcast don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends and if you enjoyed what you heard please leave a podcast rating and review that helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms you can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com and remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.